All right, so in case you've not been attached to any form of social media or anything like that, there's a big movie coming out that's been an encapsulation of six years plus in planning for the Avengers Endgame. Anybody know anything about that? Otherwise, this whole series is not going to be a bust. All right. When I first heard the, the, the title of the Avengers movie that was coming out, I, it really kind of struck a chord with me because I began to plan, and this was like last year, I began anticipating the timing of it being released in, event, in, in relation to our recognition of Christ's work and passion on Calvary. And I got caught up with this thinking of what does it mean to have an end game in view? have an end game in mind. And so a couple of things to help us out this morning. First of all, an end game, this according to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, is the final stage of some action or process. Is the final stage. The Urban Dictionary, which I don't actually go to all the time, but I just like the way it's phrased here, is this. The ultimate agenda or desired consequence of a planned series of events, often elaborate and unknown to outsiders. Isn't that kind of cool? It really struck a chord with me because one thing I really, if there's characteristics that, about God that you may like more or less, you know, there's just some things that really kind of connect with you. I love the fact that God is this incredible master strategist that somehow he's able to plan things out so far in advance and it comes true. I have hard enough time planning for a vacation, right? I struggle in the morning just making sure my socks match in the morning, right? Anyone else in the room? But God somehow is able, throughout all of time, throughout all of eternity, he has this incredible plan that is being unfolded before us and that God has an end game strategy. God has an end game strategy, not just for us as a world, not just for us as time, but for you as an individual. God has a plan for you. Here's a question that, that often challenges our perspective and how we see God interacts throughout time and especially with our own individual lives. Let me ask you today, do you see God as someone who had a great plan, but is simply now reacting, waiting for everything to play out? Or do you see him as a master planner with an in-depth strategy that is moving forward despite all outward appearances? Isn't that cool? When we talk about this moment of of celebrations, we move into the Easter week, and we begin to plan for what's called the Passion Week. As we begin to see these events unfold, there's, a, there's this method, this mindset that falls into our, our thinking at times that we think God is just simply reacting. Man sinned, man acted, God has to react, Jesus has to die, right? God, God acted, he created this great planet, we messed it up somewhere along the line, and now God has to try and fix it for all of eternity, Right? We see God oftentimes in a reactionary position. But what if I was to help you understand today that God is proactive? That God, before you and I start moving, before you and I start acting, before you and I even start breathing, God has a plan that is being unfolded and is being laid out before us. Even before the first sun lit the sky. Before that very first day. Before breath entered into Adam's son, God had a plan. And he knew all along. He knew everything that was going on and still he came. And as we celebrated Christmas, he came as a child wrapped in swaddling clothes. Even though he knew what was going on before him and why he came to live was to die. To lay down his life for many. Even though he knew all that stuff, he still came anyway. He still came knowing that you and I would receive him as Lord Savior and still mess up afterwards. Anybody? And yet God is still moving. His plan's still working. His plan is not reactionary, but proactive. He has a plan that's working out in your life even now. And you may not see everything. You may not see how it's all played out, but God is working in you and through you. So beginning this week, we're going to walk through the final events leading up to Jesus' death, as well as the unfolding of his plan in the ages to come. So today we're going to talk a little bit, and we're going to go a little bit out of order for all my Bible scholars in the room that are going to be chroniclers of the timeline of the Passion Week. Normally, Palm Sunday precedes the Last Supper, just so you all know that. I know that too. (laughs) But today is Communion Sunday, and I thought, what better day to talk about the Last Supper than when we celebrate communion? Amen? 
So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 22. By the way, if you have the church app, you can actually get my sermons a couple days ahead of time. Yeah, that doesn't mean you can skip Sunday. You still need to be here. So Luke 22 says this. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said, behold, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and they found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to him saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Will you join me as we pray one more time? Father God, I pray for clarity of thought and speech. I pray, God, your passion will continue to be unfolded before us, God, and we begin to see your incredible plan on display. Lord, I pray for a widening and increasing of our perspective and vision of seeing how you are actively moving, God. I love you, Lord, and I thank you. Be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Passover was... Not an unusual time of year. It's like Christmas time if we have to think of a, a calendar or event, a holiday that everybody would around us at least be aware of. Passover is that time in that region. Everybody understood what was going to be happening at that time. So Jesus said, it's time for Passover. It's time to get together and let's have the Passover meal together. And so he tells the disciples, I want you to go get the, to go get the place ready. And their question was simply this. Where would you like us to get things ready? How would you like things to be planned out here, God, or Jesus? And Jesus says, look, I already got it taken care of. You're going to go into town. And on the way, you're going to see a guy that's carrying some water. You're going to ask him about this, and he's going to take you exactly to the room that's already furnished. Now, think about this. You and I, think about the last time you had to plan Thanksgiving meal, right? All the ladies in the room right? You, you know the menu that has to get planned out. You know all the things that can't be on the table because people can't eat these things. And you know where people have to sit because they can't sit next to each other. You all with me, right? Anytime you plan a big event where family is coming together, you know there are certain things that have to be done, right? Mom and dad are coming over those pictures that you kept hitting in your basement. You know, take them out and you put them on the wall, right? You know, am I, I'm not, I mean, we don't do that. Mom, if you're watching, I love the gifts you give me. <laughs> you know there's a lot of things, and that day can be so stressful just trying to get all worked out. And there's always last-minute things I love, and, and I should say this, I don't actually like going to the store on Thanksgiving Day or the day before Thanksgiving, but I do kind of enjoy walking around the store on Thanksgiving Day and watching all the frantic, confused people in the room. Virgil, where's the chutney at? <laughs> right, exactly, you know. <laughs> and they're, they're all the guys, because you know they're not used to being in the grocery store, and they're just looking around going, where is everything, right? And there's this panic and desperation because things have to be done because something wasn't thought out all the way. Are you hearing me? And yet here, even in this moment, Jesus has things planned. And, and the question i got to ask is, when did Jesus and this other guy connect? We don't know. There's a little bit of mystery involved in that. Did he all of a sudden just have this incredible writing on the wall saying he's going to go get this? Or did Jesus connect with him earlier? Either way, it doesn't really matter how, but the fact that he did is what's important. And so the house was prepared for them as they came in. I love the verse 13. And when they went, they found it just as he told them. I love clear directions. I mean, that's my type A personality. I love walking to certain events and certain venues when they have everything all thought out. 
you know? When the guy who's sitting at the, the bathroom counter in the men's stall hands you the towel and then the mint in the right order, not the mint and then the towel, right? And he has, you know, when you go in and they got the lotion and the, you know, and the hand sanitizers and the, and the perfume, all that stuff, the cologne on the counter. I mean, it's just, I love those little things because it means someone actually thought about what actually takes place and what needs to take place, right? Even in the little area. And I want to just challenge you today, what if, what if, I mean, just say, what if God has everything thought out? What if God has everything already planned out? What if God knew the things that were going to happen in your life and he's already prepared things in advance for you and even good things that counter he knew the things that would be hard for you? Wow. And to think of this, Jesus comes in as they come in, they sit down at the table and begin to eat dinner. And this is the part about the Last Supper that I hope you don't blow by too quickly. Jesus knows the plan. Jesus knows the strategy. He's known it since he's been a little boy. Jesus knew the reason he came into this world was to die. Think of this for a moment. He's having this last meal. He knows that in the next several hours, things are going to begin to spiral out of control in a worldly sense. From all outside perspective, from all outside venues, everything's going to look like Jesus lost control of the event. That God had to shift into reactionary mode. That God had one plan. And yet all of humanity kind of threw him off. And so God's trying to replan because of his first plan. He's on the plan C or D at this point because plan A and B didn't work. But what if there's always only been one plan? What if there's always only been one strategy that God had from the very, very beginning laid out before us? And it's in this moment, in this setting, Jesus is reclining. He's sitting down and he's watching what God, his disciples are gathered together. They're sitting down and he begins to unfold before them. He says, look, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk. But I'm going to tell you, this cup and this bread that we're about to take is more than what you think it is. Because there's a day coming. I mean, think of this. Oh, oh, come on. You got, somebody's with me this morning, right? Amen? Amen? Think of this. Jesus is sitting here. Man, I'll get my timeline right, okay? Jesus is sitting here at the table. He's eating the bread and the wine with his disciples, right? And in a few moments, a few hours, he's going to get betrayed and turned over to sinful men, right? He's going to die and be buried, right? He's going to die. In our sense, that's the end game. In our life, in our worldly perspective, if you ask the world, it's this. You eat, sleep, drink, and die. That's it. That's the plan, right? You work somewhere in there, have some fun, but pretty much as long as you can eat, eat sleep, breathe, you, eventually you're going to die, and that's just the plan for humanity in our own limited sense. Jesus, he's going to get betrayed. He's going to get crucified. He's going to die, right? But then he's going to come back, right? And then he's going to come back again, and then he's going to come back again, right? We're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead. But Jesus, at this moment, he knows what's already transpired since the Garden of Eden. He already knew the sin that was committed and the betrayal that was committed that kicked him out of the garden. He knew all the stuff that unfolded with Israel all throughout time in history. And here he is at this moment. He says, look, a day is coming. Oh, come on. I get excited about this. Jesus, at this moment, he said, hey, I'm not going to drink this cup again until I drink it with you again in the kingdom of heaven. Well, wait a second. You're going to die. Yeah, I know, I know. But we're going to, beyond that, I got a plan. It's, it's going to keep going. That's all part of the plan. He says, I'm not going to eat this bread until we eat it again together. He says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. But let's take time to enjoy this moment because it's all part of the plan. You may be in a moment right now where you're going, maybe you're in a good spot. Or maybe you're coming out of a bad spot. Or maybe you're thinking, oh man, I'm about to head into a bad spot. I want you to know God is still bigger than all of that. Here's the good news. If you're in the bad spot, that's not the end. Amen? If you're in the good spot, that's not the best that's yet to come. There's still more. Amen? God is moving through our lives. And I want to just take a step back and say, this moment 
this, this, this table arrangement that Jesus set up with his 12 disciples, it was being set up long before that Passion Week. It was set up way back yonder in the Old Testament when they celebrated the Passover for the first time. Maybe you're familiar with the story. Passover is a day that commemorates the work of the Lord in delivering Israel from bondage in Egypt and how judgment had passed over them. Right, everyone say Passover. Passover. Right, Passover. It's that moment in time when the Israelites had already been, God had already been doing signs and wonders and the plagues had come and this was the last moment. This is the death of the firstborn, the destroyer that would come. And God told Israel, be prepared, this is what's going to happen. If you're going to escape this judgment, if you're going to escape this penalty, this is what you need to do. You need to sacrifice a lamb, and you're going to put the blood on the doorposts. And when the destroyer comes, he's going to see the blood, and he's going to pass over you. You all with me? And when they did not have the blood on their doorposts, on their lintels, they lost the firstborn. The firstborn died that day, and such a calamity arose in all of Egypt that has not yet been seen since, the scripture says. Imagine, all the firstborns in the room, raise your hand. Thank you for participating. (laughs) This is your end game. But fortunately, fortunately, the angel saw the blood and passed over them, right? And so Moses gives them this instruction. If you're not familiar with this story, I want to challenge you to go to the book of Exodus and read verses or chapter 10 and following. But in chapter 12, we see this. He tells them how they're going to eat this meal because they have to eat a meal before they take this long journey. And this is where they, it's called the Passover meal. It says this in verse 11. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments, I am the Lord. The the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast." So Israel recognized the significance of this event. This was the last meal they were going to have in Egypt before they got out. And it was through God's working and through his mighty hand, the scripture says, that he delivers Israel and he brings them out. This is all part of the plan. See, in fact, the whole process of Israel being in Egypt and being in bondage and the deliverer and all that stuff, that was all prophesied long ago. God's not, God's not reactionary. God's been planning this whole thing out since the beginning of eternity. Let your mind think about that one for a little bit, right? And this plan continues to unfold. And so at that moment, those folks that are gathered in those little shacks and those little huts in the land of Egypt, the land of Goshen, they don't even understand the significance about what they're about to do. They don't even understand that this is part of God's end game. That in that moment, there's a signifying, there's a type, there's an understanding that the blood was a symbol. That whoever is under the blood would be protected. The angel would pass over them. In the same way we see the symbolism, all the such strong symbolism of Christ who gave of himself, whose blood was shed on Calvary, that when someone says, as a believer, are you covered in the blood? That's not a Christine quote. Okay, good. None of you watch Stephen King. That's great. But you are covered by the work of Christ on Calvary. And then any judgment passes over. Isn't that kind of cool? God had this unfolding from the very beginning. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 7, it says this. And then you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, and all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. This was supposed to be a time of celebration. It was a time of recognition of what God had done. Something set up way back in the Old Testament, back in times of ancient Israel, being unfolded right here at this moment with Christ, with his disciples. And Christ is saying, this is even it. This is even the end yet. Because there's a greater dinner that's about to happen. Oh, blessed is the one that can take place at the marriage feast, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Isn't that kind of cool? There's a day coming when we will once again sit around the table with Jesus. There's another dinner about to happen. 
It's continuing to unfold that you are not just merely a blip. You're not just merely an extra on the scene, but you are a main character in the story of God's plan unfolding throughout all of creation. I, if you cannot, if I, oh man, I just got to, I'm going to go Bible nerd on you for a second, so just brace yourselves, okay? If you read the Old Testament and you're not amazed at how God works through all the time, you're reading it wrong. Because you can see over and over again how God works through the Old Testament. He's setting things up constantly for the next generation. The next generation, things are continuing to unfold, right? Right? When Israel leaves the, the promised land, they, they come, or leave Egypt, they come into the promised land. God's leading them and guiding, providing them food, manna, right? Water from a rock. God supernaturally provides from symbolisms of Christ's provision in and through our lives. We see him working through the lives of individuals as they come to, rec- come to knowledge of who God is. When they, people invade Jericho, Rahab's there. And because she honors God, he, she uh, doesn't turn the spies over. As a result, her children are part of the lineage of Christ. Isn't that incredible? All these things are unfolding, which means is this. You are not insignificant. I really feel like i got to pause this even part of my message. This is totally free. Right? But I really feel for someone in this room, you need to hear this. You are not insignificant. God does have a plan for you. And it may not make sense to you right now. You may not see how it all works together. That's okay. You don't have to. Isn't that cool? Because the problem is, is this. I'm just, this is not a wait. If I knew what the plan is, I would try and fix it. Anybody else in the room, right? You know, you know, God, I know you want this to happen tomorrow, but we could do that today. I got enough room in my calendar for that. And God says, no, I got a time for this. I got a season because everything's going to build up. Everything's working together. All things work together for good for those that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen. So God is working in your life, and this plan is continuing to unfold even now in this church. I get excited when a pastor, I'm totally off script, by the way. Um, I'm so excited as a pastor when I stop and think about the generations that are coming up and the people that are coming to Christ and those that are going out in the ministry and those that, the impact that's happening, right? Think of it, you're here today because somebody told you about us, right? And you're going to tell somebody else and they're going to come and who knows? I mean, literally, who knows? You could be inviting the next Billy Graham, Billy Sunday. Smith Wigglesworth. You could be inviting in the next whoever that's going to have an impact on the world around you. You could be that person too. Are you ready? God's plan is continuing to unfold. We understand then when we come to this last supper, which we will now recognize as communion, the Lord's Supper, we recognize that this, today this practice is gathering together is to remember what God has done in saving and delivering us so that we will not forget. Amen? Those gathering, even after Jesus' resurrection, after his ascendance into heaven, as the early church would gather together, they would still come together, even in the midst of the strongest of persecutions, even knowing that when they gathered together, they became a bigger target, they would still come together, and these would become known as agape feasts or love feasts. Are you all with me? Everyone say love feast. Here's an example of some of the earliest love feasts found in Acts chapter 20, or Acts 20, verses 7 through 12. It says this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room, and we were gathered, and the young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talks longer still. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Is that the end game? No. Paul went down, bent over him, taking him in his arms. He says, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten. He conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and they were greatly comforted. Isn't that amazing? Paul gathers together. He's going to talk with them. He's going to talk until midnight. Amen. Pastor's not talking that long today. <laughs> All right. It gets warm in the room. There's candles. You know, it's just that right moment. Eutychus is sitting by the window because of a nice cool breeze, you know, but he's listening. All of a sudden, he dozes off, and out the window he goes. 
on the ground. Now here's the rub. Something like happened today, what would we do? We'd panic. I'm sure they were a little upset and frightened too. But just even as Aaron shared, I love that earlier this morning with, with Vivian. Let's go to God first, right? And so here he is. He goes down. Oh, he's not dead. He's still alive. He was only mostly dead. <laughs> so he gets up, and he continues with the breaking of bread with them. The early church continued to gather together. And Hippolytus, an early church historian, gives us a little insight in this. He says this, that the basic form of the agape meal indicate that the Eucharist is followed by the fellowship meal. In his instructions, Hippolytus urges his readers, listen to this, to embody in the meal the self-control, compassion, and holiness he regards as a characteristic of the believer. So this moment, this love feast, became a very significant time for the early church. That people from all different backgrounds would gather together and that they would recognize what God had done in their lives and that God would continue to move in their lives until the day of his return when they would all be with him in heaven for eternity. Amen? So here's some guiding principles I want to give you as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper this morning. And I'll be quick this morning. So quickly, here we go. Because we know that whenever two, people, two or three people gather together, there's a possibility of misunderstanding and conflict. Right? <laughs> Even so, in the early church. So the Apostle Paul gave some directions to the early church. And this first thing is this. First, you've got to understand, when we come to the Lord's safe table, self-examination is essential. You have to be willing to look at yourself. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight through 30 says this. Let a person examine himself, then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. Whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That many, that's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Okay, you all with me now? Got everybody's attention? Communion is serious stuff because we're recognizing Christ's body, his church. We're recognizing the body, the bread that's represented there and what he's done for us and what he's doing in us, right? Which means we have to pause and stop. We have to pause and stop and reflect on what Christ has actually done. Here's a, here's a great thought. Think of all the losers in the room right now. <laughs> right? Make sure you hold up your mirror. Right? But think of this. Everyone in this room, you come from a different story, a different background. We have all, by our own nature, are failures. Yeah. Right? And that would seem like the end of the story. Aren't you glad God didn't leave you there? Right? So here's the incredible great grace of strength and grace vision today. Is if God can save you and change you, he can do it for the person next to you as well. Right? So there's people in this room. There are people that are gathered in churches all around this city, all around our state, nation, etc. That don't look like you, don't talk like you, don't act like you, may even do dumb things. Right? But there's still grace enough for them as there was for you. So let's pause and stop before we cast a stone, before we hold on to a stone of offense. We stop and remember what Christ has done for us. Amen? Secondly is this. When it comes to the Lord's table, selfishness is out of place. Grace has to be our rule. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three continues on, says this. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together, eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come. Now, this seems a little strange, but i got to set up a little background for you and I, how this makes sense. Joseph Bingham writes in 1870, he gives an account, I'm going to summarize it briefly, is this. Is that somewhere along the line in church history, the church quit sharing everything in common. You with me? Because if you go back to the book of Acts, all your paycheck went to the church. No amen on that one. I was waiting. I was giving an extra Holy Spirit pause on that one. <laughs> Scripture says they held everything in common. They shared. And if anyone was in need, they took what they needed. They didn't take more. Right? But somewhere along the line in history, we retreated just a little bit. Right? And the rich held their stuff and the poor had nothing. Right? 
So he says this here, there's this opportunity, they're going to come together and have an eating time, they're going to have a feast together, and then they're going to have the Eucharist, they're going to have the fellowship of communion together, and in the process, if they're not careful, someone could out-eat someone else. You know what's really hard is when you have three brothers and there's only eight slices of pizza. <laughs> right? You know what's going to happen. You know, right? There's eight slices. Let's just do the math. Eight and three. That means I get three slices of pizza. Because <laughs> I'm older and faster than my other two brothers. Right? Someone's going to go a little less. But that's selfishness. It's really easy when we look at where our situations are at. It's really easy to know where we're coming in from and the baggage and the hurt and the pains of the week. We come in and we want to make it all about us. I'm hungry too. Paul says, hey, look, wait a second. Go home and eat first and then come together. If you have the money, if, you have, if you're rich, you can eat first. The poor, when they come, they have, may not have enough. So this truly may be a potluck blessing for them. Bring him. Joseph Bingham, I would say, continues on. He says this, For though the rich did not make all their substance common, yet upon certain days appointed, they made a common table. And when their service was ended, they all had communicated in the holy mysteries, they all met at a common feast. The rich bringing provisions and the poor and those who had nothing being invited, they all feasted in common together. So here's the thing. The rich still practiced throughout the church. They still brought excess into the church. Right? I mean, can I, can I just be silly for a moment? Imagine we're going to do another pot blessing or pot luck, whatever your faith will provide you to believe in. And we gather together, and you're here, and you say, you know what? There's only five people in my family, so I only brought five servings. Are, are you with me? You're not with me? <laughs> well, that means is this, is that means I get five, that my family's going to be taken care of, but you're going to be hungry, Corbin. <laughs> and we don't want that. Right? So you know, you know that it's just etiquette that if you can bring a little more, you bring a little bit more, right? Y'all with me? In this same way, God's blessed your life. God's blessed you in some area you have more than someone else has. So when we come together and we celebrate what God has done, let's not, not hold back and be stingy, but let grace abound, amen? And lastly is this, self-awareness is needed. Because Jude says this, verses 12 through 13. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding only themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Jude addresses the fact that throughout the ages, there are those who have sought to corrupt, take advantage of, and demean the practice of remembering what Christ has done. And Paul and Jude would encourage us today to take careful note of what God has done. As a church, we practice open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of the church to take communion with us today because we believe in the grace of God. Right? But we do believe in one thing that is one requirement that we hold fast to, and this is this is that in order to take communion, you have to recognize who Christ is and what Christ has done. You recognize that Jesus Christ is God and that he died on the cross for your sins, whom you've asked to forgive you of yours, and you've allowed him to be the Lord of your life. That's the requirement, that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, both as Lord and as Savior. That's really the only requirement we have, but it's such an incredible one because if we eat and drink and we don't even think about it, if we're just popping bread and slugging down shots of grape juice, right? That's all it becomes. It's all it becomes, and it loses its power. And as a result, listen to this, that is why many of you have fallen sick and some have died, Paul says. He tells Timothy later on in 1 Timothy 4.16, he says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in doing this, for by doing so you'll save both yourself and your hearers. I'm going to challenge some of you today to take your faith level to another, another level, another step. 
is a lot of times we live our faith simply for ourselves, but we don't understand sometimes that the life we live and the faith we pray and, and, and we live out actually has an impact on those around us. Right? If someone came in that was a, was a blatant Satanist, right? They've got the, the black cloak on. They've got 666 carved in their head. I mean, just be as obvious as you can about it, right? And they come in, and they're going to just say, I don't love Jesus, but I want some of this communion anyway. We go, hey, I love you, bro, but that's not going to happen. And they go, what? Aren't we supposed to be included? No, no, there's a point where we have to safeguard and understand the significance of what's happening here. For his sake, I wouldn't want him to take it. Are you hearing me? Because I don't want him to eat and drink. I want him to receive grace. I want him to receive mercy. Right? I hopefully if that happens, you all start praying really hard. And all my Pentecostals start praying in tongues. Come on. Yeah. Right? I mean, because we're believing God can cast out demons. We believe God can heal the sick, raise the dead. Right? This is what communion is all about. So when you take it in a moment, I want you to just pause and do a couple things. I want you to stop and seriously look at yourself. If you're here today and there's sin in your life that you've been playing with, stop. Stop. Well, how do I do that? Say, God, I confess this to you. I confess my sins to you because you're faithful and just to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. God, I don't want this in my life anymore. Amen? Examine yourself. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you, don't be uncomfortable about it. You don't have to take communion. Isn't that kind of weird for the pastor to say that? But I want you to understand why. I want you to take communion, but I want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ more. Because communion is a proclamation of what God has done in us and through us. Amen? The other thing is this. As you hold the emblems in your hand, I want you to take time to discern who the Lord's body is. This is a hard one. Right now, if you're here and, and you've got anger against somebody, somebody's hurt you, somebody's wounded you, you've got to take the bold step of faith and say, God, it still hurts. Things aren't right yet, but I'm going to choose to forgive. Are you hearing me? That's the hard part. God, just as you've forgiven me, I've forgiven them. Because here's the great thing. I mean, think of all the stuff you've done wrong in your life. We'll give you some extra time here. (laughs) All right? And yet God still chose, he still chose to forgive you. That's grace. Show that grace to those that are in need around you as well. Amen? So they take communion Let us truly ask and treat it as a solemn affair this morning if we can. So I'm going to ask you this. This is the rule of the house right now. Don't leave the room. You with me? Let's not get up and wander around right now. We're all going to sit and be in order. We're going to have the emblems, and we're going to wait till everybody's been served, right? I know you're hungry. I'm going to let you out really soon, right? But this is not snack time. You with me? This is a somber event. But it's also a time of rejoicing. We recognize what Christ has done, but we recognize what Christ is doing and about to do. Amen? Tracy, if you'd come, if our ushers would come, as we prepare prepare our hearts. The end game here is this, is understanding that what we practice today is more than a spiritual stack time or even a religious practice to appease a fickle God. Are you catching me? Instead, we pause to remember the incredible act of deliverance that Christ has brought about in our lives and is about to bring out in the age to come. The Apostle Paul then writes to the early church in Corinth, For what I received from the Lord, I also now deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you join me as we give thanks for this bread together? Lord, we thank you for your body, which is broken on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for this bread of fellowship and provision, that you, O oh Lord, would take our place, that you would carry the weight of all the sin of humanity upon yourselves, upon yourself, Lord, and that you would bring healing and strength for us. I thank you, Lord, for this bread. This is the bread of fellowship and inclusion, God, that you have invited us to come and sit at the table with you because of your incredible work. We thank you for your body, for this bread, which is broken on on our behalf. We give you praise.
in a seat together. In the same way the Apostle Paul continues, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In a moment, as we prepare to receive this cup, I want to challenge you in a couple things once again. One, that as you drink, you receive and recognize the forgiveness of Christ in and through your life. Amen? But also drink with the hope and the, and the understanding that we are proclaiming that Jesus is coming again. And that there is a day coming as part of his divine plan that we will be with him for all of eternity. Isn't that incredible? Lord, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for the incredible symbolism that is tied with it, Lord. That you, O oh Lord, cleansed us through your work on Calvary. Lord, we know that the wages of sin is death. And that there is no atoning for sin except through a sacrifice of blood. And Lord, we thank you that your love for us was so great that you would lay down your life for us and call us your friend. Lord, we thank you so much that you have made a way for us to be with you for all eternity. So we drink this cup in celebration of what you've done, having cleansed and made us whole, making us a child of God. And we look forward to the day also that we will drink it with you in the kingdom of heaven. What a glorious day that will be. Lord, we thank you for this cup. Let us drink together. So this is the last part of the message. It's simply this. I'm going to challenge you. I know it may be last minute, but go out and have a meal with someone else in the church today. Maybe you can't do lunch because I know there's a meeting going on right away. Right, Miss Cassie? But maybe dinner. Part of the, the defining characteristic of the early church that was set in and seen through this Last Supper is the fellowship of believers. And so I'm going to challenge you. Find someone that you haven't had a meal with and go have fellowship with one another. Encourage one another, right? Don't just talk about the NCAA brackets, right? But talk about how Christ has impacted and shaped and changed your life. And you'll be amazed at what God has done. Amen? Father God, I just thank you for your church, and I pray now for your church. I pray, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you and go out as you would gather back in. And may the joy of the Lord be your strength, both now and forevermore. In the name of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, be now blessed. Amen. God bless you.